Great. Yes, a short week this week. Wednesday is advising day. Make sure you use your advisor. I guess I have to send out a note to everybody, but um, sign up with your advisor to me on Wednesday and go over your general and spring schedules, which you probably already know, but good to talk about it anyway. There will be, like I mentioned last week, a, a good chunk of completion problems to work on here for Friday, but nothing to turn in, no breaking problems for Friday. But there are a lot of problems that I end up assigning from section 5.3. And I'd like to do the first one since evidently I forgot to put a, an actual answer key for that one in the solutions. Uh, so if you've got your book, you can look at, well, I guess it's referring to theorem 5.14 to prove that. So theorem 5.14 is on page 177. We did talk about this last, last time. Okay, suppose you've got a Riemann integrable function on an interval. Suppose f is Riemann integrable on the closed interval from a to b. And suppose you've got a sequence of tag partitions whose norms are approaching zero. There's a sequence of tag partitions, one tag partition for each positive integer n. For example, the tags could be right-hand endpoints for each of them. They don't have to be, but they could be. Consider the sequence of norms of those type partitions. Meshes, again, is another name for that. That's the sequence of numbers. Suppose that that converges to zero. Then the corresponding sequence of Riemann sums for those type partitions converges to the integral. There's three sequences going on here. There's the sequence of tag partitions. There's the corresponding sequences, sequence of norms of those tag partitions. And then there's the corresponding sequence of Riemann sums. All right, let's see if we can do a full proof of this without, without bothering with scratch work. The goal is to prove that this sequence of Riemann sums converges to the integral. That's a sequence of numbers. We need to think chapter 2. For any given epsilon greater than zero, I must find a capital N, a positive integer capital N. So the distance between a Riemann sum for a little n greater than or equal to the capital N and the value of the integral can be made less than epsilon. For all little n sufficiently large greater than or equal to the capital N that we find. We need to use what we're assuming. It's Riemann integrable, so the integral exists. There's no problem there. This sequence converges to zero. That must be relevant. Probably we are going to need the definition of Riemann integ integrability, too, because we're relating it to tag partitions. Let me just guess that the next step is going to be since f is Riemann integrable on the closed interval from a to b, we can choose delta greater than 0 by the definition of Riemann integrability such that the distance between a Riemann sum an arbitrary Riemann sum for an arbitrary tag partition, not necessarily one of the tag partitions in the sequence. That distance is less than epsilon for all tag partitions in 
PP of the interval from A to B such that the norm of that tag partition is less than delta. So I'm choosing the delta first. What do you think should be my next step? Any, any intuition here? <laughs> Ultimately, I have to find the capital one. Do you think? Probably that the norm converges. Yeah, use that fact that the norm of those tag partitions for this sequence of tag partitions converges to zero to say, yes, you got to use that. What should I use it to say? Since the sequence of norms converges to zero, there exists, or I can choose, we can choose. What? What should I say? Ignore everything else, just focus on this. Since this sequence of numbers converges to zero, we can choose what? Chapter two. A capital N. Such that what? Should I make the distance between this and zero less than epsilon? Less than delta. Delta is positive. I can do that. And that'll do it. We're almost done. Well, I should emphasize for all little n greater than or equal to capital N. We're almost done. Then for little n greater than or equal to capital N, the fact that this is true means that this is true when you have the TPN right there. And that doesn't. So for little n greater than or equal to capital N, the distance between the Riemann sum with respect to the tag partition in the original sequence with the subscript n and the value of the integral is less than epsilon, and that does it. Praise the Lord. Make sense? That's an exam level proof, I think. So that could be an exam three. Already thinking how to take exam three. I think exam three is maybe November 18th. <coughs> Good, uh, what, four weeks away or so? So. Any questions? Three, yeah, exams during the semester. Then the final exam. Yeah. The final exam is cumulative, but there will be a heavier emphasis in chapters seven and eight on the final exam. All right. Uh, main focus today is going to be the fundamental theorem of calculus. write down the book statement. I'm going to try to do it from memory. And I won't necessarily get it word for word, but hopefully I get this the right meaning. Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, FTC, which by the way is the, the discovery of this theorem by Newton and Leibniz was the start of calculus. Okay, people, people knew how to find some kinds of areas. Back to ant antiquity, right? The Greeks, Archimedes, to a certain degree, understood the formula for the area of a circle, although they didn't have formulas per se back then. Um, understood that it was related to pi, though they didn't use our notation for pi back then, even though pi is a Greek letter, which was also related to the 
ratio of its the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. So people knew how to find areas of some things, maybe even areas under some graphs to that point in other ways. And people knew how to find equations of tangent lines, well, slopes of tangent lines to begin with for certain kinds of things. It's putting the two together with the fundamental theory of calculus, putting differentiation and integration together. That was the fundamental breakthrough. Suppose little f is Riemann integrable on the closed interval from a to b. There's two parts we're writing down. Part a, define a function f, capital F, I should say, by the equation by the formula, capital F of x equals the integral from a to x of the function little f. And when we write this in calculus, typically we you know, do write a variable for the little f, and we write maybe something other than x, like a t, we write something like that. It's good to use a different letter, by the way, for future teachers. It's good to use a different letter here compared to that. Emphasize the variable here is in the upper limit of the integral. <clears throat> um, you can say then capital F is continuous on the closed interval from A to B. Moreover, little f doesn't have to be continuous, but capital F is. Moreover, if little f happens to be continuous, on the closed interval from A to B, then in fact capital F will be differentiable. It is differentiable on A, B, and its derivative is little f. We have constructed an antiderivative of little f. I'll say it is capital F prime equals little f on the interval from A to B, but I could also say that capital F prime of x equals little f of x for all x in the interval from A to B. Actually, I think the way the book phrases it, I'm remembering just now, is they emphasize f, little f being continuous at a point, and capital F is differentiable at all points where little f is continuous, and at those points this is true. So I'm phrasing it a little differently. Mm -hmm. Is it more over if f is continuous? Yes. Thank you. So yeah, I think the book, book emphasizes the second assumption not necessarily being that little f is continuous on the whole interval. But capital F is differentiable at each point where little f is continuous. And at those points, capital F prime equals little f. Okay, so they phrase it a bit differently. Theirs is, I suppose you could say, a bit stronger. And you should know theirs for the test. Okay. So I would probably take off a point or something from my answer. I was writing this on the test because it's not quite as strong as the book statement. It's, it's still true. It's just not quite as strong of a theorem. Second part is the one you're more used to. If capital G is an antiderivative, of little f on the interval from a to b. So capital G prime of x equals little f of x for all x in the interval. Then you can evaluate the integral of little f by doing the difference capital G of b minus capital G of a. So 
that's the one you're used to. That tells you how to integrate functions if you can find an antiderivative, which is oftentimes a big if, actually. It's not so easy sometimes, and in fact, sometimes is technically impossible in finite closed form, is the way people phrase it, as a finite combination of elementary functions by addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, root finding, and what else? Composition. It can be impossible to find, we find G. Like we saw with Kinney of X, we can do great new functions and try to patent them. <laughs> of course, it's only useful to patent it if somebody, you think somebody might steal it and you think it's a useful thing. <clears throat> This one we're less used to, though you should have been taught it in calculus. I try to emphasize it when I teach calculus. Sometimes they call this the antiderivative construction theorem. We can construct an antiderivative of a given function lil f by this formula, if lil f is continuous at least. That function of x, where the x is in the upper limit of the integral, is an antiderivative of little f. I emphasized that at the end of class last Friday with a graph that was a semicircle, and we found an antiderivative of the function whose graph was the upper unit semicircle squared root of 1 minus x squared by thinking about the area interpretation of the integral. Let's do another example like that, except this time let's make it a piecewise linear function. In fact, let's go over, over to the screen here. I'm going to pick a particular piecewise linear function that I'm going to see on Mathematica in this section. Well, OK, I'll, I'll just look at the formula here initially. That's going to be my piecewise linear function. Zoom in on that. See it? I'll write the formula up here. It's going to be t plus 3 for the output when t is between negative 3 and negative 2, 1 if t is between negative 2 and 4, and negative t minus 4 plus 1, which is of course the same as negative t plus 5, if t is between 4 and 7. Why did I write it that way? You'll see why here in a second. The graph of this thing like that when t is between negative 3 and negative 2. Then it's constant until you get to 4. Then the reason I wrote the formula like this initially was just it's a little quicker to see that the rest of the graph has to go through the point 4, 1. When t is 4, the output is 1. It's got a slope of negative 1. The graph over here looks like this. Let's consider it over this interval here from negative 3 to 7. <clears throat> and define a function, capital F of x, to be the integral of this thing from negative 3x. Now let's find a formula for capital F, not by looking at the screen. Let's ignore this for the moment. Hide it. But instead by thinking about the geometry of the integral interpretation, the geometric interpretation of integration. First off, imagine x is between negative 3 and negative 2. That's going to be our first case. I'm going to draw multiple x's in this picture. But our first case that we're going to think about is the case where x is between negative 3 and negative 2. In that case, the integral is the area of a triangle. That triangle right there. <coughs> 
What's the area of that triangle? One half base that time. You can get that in terms of x. The base is x minus negative 3, right? x plus 3. The height is f of x. Plug in x into the function in place of t. In the case where x is between negative 2 and negative 3, that gives you x plus 3. Base and the height are the same. So the integral is the area if x is between negative 3 and negative 2, 1 half base times height is that. I'll go ahead and expand it out. That's 1 half x squared plus 3x plus 9 halves. And note, this is a function whose derivative is the same as little f when you plug in x. In that case, where x is between negative two, 3 and negative 2. Okay, so what's the point here? The point is we are illustrating Initially, in this case, where x is between negative 3 and negative 2, that if you think about the area interpretation of the integral, not, no, not thinking about limits at all, not thinking about Riemann sums, that's good, right? We're happy not to do that. That we do get an antiderivative of the original function, in that case at least. What about the other two cases? Next case, x is between negative 2 and positive 4. Where? I don't know. Let's pretend it's right there. That's my next case for x. What's the integral from negative 3 to x? What's the value of capital F of x? It would be the area of the whole triangle over here plus the area of a rectangle that looks like that. Our right dark over here, is it okay? x is between negative 2 and 4, I guess I meant this to be a strict less than, but this is a continuous function anyway. Capital F of x being the integral of little f from negative 3 to x, let me rewrite that, is the area of this whole triangle, whose base is 1 and height is 1, <coughs> area 1 half, plus the area of this rectangle, Base is x minus negative 2, which is x plus 2. Height is 1. This is 1 half <coughs> plus x plus 2 times 1. We get x plus 5 halves upon simplification. And that is a function whose derivative is always 1. It's always the value of little f. When in the case where x is between negative 2 and 4, replace the t with an x, you get an output of 1. Technically, case 3, you might say x is between 4 and 7, but it is, I think, worthwhile to cons consider two subcases. One where x is between 4 and 5, and one where x is between 5 and 7. Let's consider the subcase where x is between 4 and 5. Technically speaking, I'm going to think of this as a, a trapezoid right here, though in the case where x is 5, it becomes a triangle. Capital F of x is the area of this triangle plus the area of this rectangle plus the area of that trapezoid. Area of that triangle is 1 half. Area of the whole rectangle is 6 times 1 is 6. What's the area of a trapezoid? Let's see, 6 and a half again was the area of the triangle and rectangle put together. That's 13 halves. What's the area of the trapezoid? Is the, is the base times the average of the heights is the area of the trapezoid. 
You can also break it into a, a rectangle and a triangle if you like. But the area of a trapezoid like that in general is the base, which is x minus 4, times the average of the heights. One height over here on the left is 1. The other height is f of x, where x is in this case, so it's that formula. One plus negative x plus five over two, right? Again, I'll say it, this height here is one, this height here is f of x, but f of x when x is between four and five is given by this formula, replace t with x. Get that, this is the average of those two heights. Let's simplify. This simplifies to what? Negative one half x, and we have a six divided by two is three. So negative one half here. Let's go ahead and expand it out. Still dark enough? Zoom in if you need to. Looks good. Okay. Thirteen halves. Uh, okay. Expand this out. Foil. We got x times negative one half x is minus one half x squared. Outside times outside is three x. Inside times inside is two x. Last times last is minus twelve. Negative one half x squared plus five x. Uh, twelve is twenty four halves. So what do we get? Minus eleven halves. Is the derivative of this right? Differentiate this, get negative x plus 5, <coughs> which matches that when you plug in x in place of t. Haven't verified that this function is continuous yet at these points where it might not be conceivably at 2 and 4 so far. Are these different formulas for capital F going to match up? Is the graph going to be continuous? It will be if I've not made a mistake. I think I've done things right so far. Let's consider one more case where x is between 5 and 7. Now the integral is the area of this entire thing, which itself is a trapezoid, minus the area of that triangle there. Minus, right? It's below the axis. If you think of the area itself as positive, then you're subtracting the area. So, in that case, capital F of X, the area of this whole thing here is one half plus six plus another half, including that whole triangle over there, seven minus the area of this triangle here. Minus one half base is x minus seven. Height as a positive quantity is negative f of x. That's a positive quantity when x is bigger than five. I'm subtracting this thing to emphasize that for the integral I subtract the area when you think of the area as a positive quantity. Let's simplify this. I hope, what do I hope? I hope I get the same thing I got back here. Because I am in this case where it's still the same graph going down there. I hope I get that function right there when I simplify. Should if I have not made a mistake. I do see I have a negative one half x squared. Um, did I make a mistake? No. Is there a mistake? There must be a mistake somewhere, huh? Because I'm getting a plus six x. 
Anybody see my mistake? It could be back here. Oh, I think I see it. No? No. Right now. Anybody see the mistake? There must be one somewhere. Nobody sees it? I don't see it. I'm finding the area of this triangle is one half base times height. Oh, you're not doing trapezoid outside. Wait a minute, why did I write the base is x minus 7? That yeah. must be the problem. It's x minus 5. I think that's the mistake. Uh -huh. I'm feeling better about this. Plus 5x. 1 half times 25 is 12 and a half. Got a minus sign there. 7 minus 12 and a half is negative 5 and a half. That is the same as minus 11 halves. There we go. That was the mistake. Right there. Same formula. That's good. In Mathematica, that is what I plugged in for <coughs> capital F, though I used T for the variable. Doesn't matter. I hope. And it, that book, it doesn't look like what I plugged in. The constants are different. Oh, is there another mistake? Did I erase my first case? Yeah, I erased my first case. What did I get for the first case? Plus nine halves instead of plus seven. <sighs> Easy to make mistakes with this. Which one's wrong? Is it? I wonder, I wonder if I did my integral at a different base here for this one. I might have done the integral starting at zero. I remember now. Yeah, okay, okay. Ignore this. This, this is just a different antiderivative. It's not the same one we just found. It differs from the one we just found by a constant. So we go to the Mathematica, <clears throat> as far as the formula goes. This red graph is not the antiderivative we just found. It's the antiderivative we just found plus 2 and a half. Why did I do that? Because it makes a cool animation. Blue water makes red water. No, don't focus on the colors. Those are just, those are just for clarity. <clears throat> the red graph is the water level. You could think of that as a height if you prefer. I guess I graphed it as if it's a height. Well, you could think of it as a volume if you had it in volume units. And the blue graph is its derivative. The blue graph is the derivative of the red. The red is the integral of the blue. Not the integral we found, not the antiderivative we found, but the antiderivative we found plus two and a half. The antiderivative we found um, started at a value of zero when the time was negative three. 
that would correspond to the tank being empty at the start. I don't have an empty tank at the start here. The blue tells you about slopes of the red. It's the derivative of the red. The red integrates the blue, essentially. The change in the red is given by the integral of the blue. You stop it anywhere? The change in the red, for example, from time negative 3 to time 0 is the integral of the blue from time negative 3 to time 0. 1 half plus 2, 2 and a half is the change in the red. Yeah, the red went from 2 and a half up to 5. It increased by 2 and a half as time went from negative 3 to 0. If I let time go ahead by 4, from 0 to 4, about here. Now the integral of the blue is 4. The change in the red is 4. That's the change in the water level from 5 up to 9. I got even more fun examples. Once again, here with this example, I'm not looking at formulas, just looking at the graphs. Blue is the derivative of the red. The red is an antiderivative of the blue. You can find that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can find changes in the value of the red by integrating the blue. For example, if you integrate the blue from about negative 1.4 or so to positive, well, okay, actually look at the intercept here. The intercept, I believe, maybe is at negative 1.5 to positive 1.5. The change in red is the integral of the blue. It's the area of this region here. And we eyeball the area of that region. It's almost a triangle of base 4 and height 3. The area of such a triangle is 6. It's a little bit more than the area of such a triangle. The change in the red should be a little bit more than 6. The red goes from about 2 up to about 8, close to 6. When the integral of the blue is negative, like between 1 and a half and this must be more than 2 apart, 4.7 or so, the change in the red is negative 6 or so, because the integral of the blue is negative 6. One more example just for fun. This one goes up and down a lot. I also bring this uh, into my calculus classes because it illustrates flow problems. Blue is the net flow in, say, gallons per second or gallons per minute, or I guess it's gallons per minute. And red is the amount of gallons. To find the change in the amount of gallons, The change in the red integrate its rate of change, integrate its derivative. <coughs> and that's actually another way that the other equation can be interpreted. You are used to interpreting this as a way of evaluating an integral. Capital G is an antiderivative of little f. But you can also sort of switch it around in your mind to find the change in the function g integrate its rate of change over the interval. f is its derivative, but I can also just call that g prime. And to find the change in a function over an interval, if it's differentiable, you can integrate it. It's derivative. Though for us to be sure that that integral exists, we'd want to assume that g prime is continuous. We know continuous functions are integrable. There are certainly non-continuous functions that are also Riemann integrable. But for us to sort of play it safe, if you're going to interpret it as the fine change in a function integrate its rate of change, you'd want to, we would want to assume that g prime is continuous to feel confident that we can do the integral. <clears throat> and by do the integral, I mean 
in general, just approximate it. Use numerical integration, for example. Or use areas of well-known objects if your graph is simple, piecewise linear, or maybe you've got pieces that are semicircles, like we did the last time. I don't want to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus today, but I want to use it for a couple other proofs. I want to prove the um, formula for substitution in terms of definite intervals. And I'd probably just do a sketch of the proof, though, not a full proof. It's kind of a strange looking formula, actually. And so the first thing to understand is just how the formula that I'm about to write down relates to ordinary kinds of integrals that you've done in the past. In our book's notation, it looks like this. To integrate a function like that, what? F circle G times G prime is what this is. Circle being the composition operator. Have we talked about the composition operator? F circle G or fog of X is F of G of X. <coughs> and we're used to writing it like that. And we seem to avoid in calculus classes these days writing it like that. Why is it worth writing it that like that with a circle there? It's not an O, even though we sometimes say fog. It's because it emphasizes that the composition can be thought of as an operation, combining two functions to get a new function, a binary operation, analogous to plus, minus, times, and divide. New operation circle. It's not commutative. Goff, G circle F. G of f of x, you know, in general, is not the same as f of g of x. Anyway, that's the operation here. Integrating f circle g, f composed g, times g prime from a to b, the claim is that under appropriate hypotheses about f and g, that this equals the integral of f from g of a to g of b. What are the appropriate hypotheses about f? Well, certainly if you assumed f and g were differentiable, or you could probably get away with assuming g is differentiable with continuous derivative, and f is just continuous, you could probably get away with those assumptions. But I think the book gets away with even weaker assumptions, giving you a stronger theorem. You know that, right? Weaker assumptions give you stronger theorems. Weaker assumption means it applies to more situations. You aren't assuming as much. They assume, okay, they assume G is differentiable and F is continuous. They don't, they don't assume G prime is, Riemann, is continuous, but they do assume it's Riemann integrable. A little weaker assumption than assuming G prime is continuous. The conclusion is then F circle G times G prime is Riemann integrable, and this equation is true. Before I try to sketch the proof of this, let's see how it relates to Substitution when you think of it in the ordinary way from calculus. <clears throat> Say you were integrating um, 2x cosine of x squared. Say from, let me make things work out nicely here, square root of pi over 6 to square root of pi over 3. The square roots will make things work out nicely. The square root here. You would do this integral by a substitution, or actually, you could guess the answer. And you'd probably be right. I'm confident that you could all guess the antiderivative. But if you're going to do a substitution, <clears throat> whether you use u substitution or w substitution, like our book, doesn't matter. I kind of like the books, our calc books approach using w. Because then you get to say dw. Hey, Arthur. <laughs> Sorry. 
W equals x squared. DW is 2x dx. So you're really integrating cosine of W dW. If you do this as a definite integral the entire way, you must change the limits of integration. Of course, sometimes you just do the indefinite integral first and then do the definite integral. But if I've switched to W here and I want to say these are equal, I must change the limits of integration to say they're equal. How? Plug them into the formula, is it a substitution? When x is square root of pi over 6, then w is pi over 6. When x is square root of pi over 3, then w is pi over 3. Integral and derivative of cosine w is sine w. Keep the new limits of integration. Do not go back to x. So we get sine of pi over 3 minus sine of pi over 6. Square root of 3 over 2 minus 1 half. Square root of 3 minus 1 over 2, right? This is related to this. How? Well, identify what f and g are. We are plugging x squared into the cosine function here. There's your composition. f must be cosine x. f of x must be cosine x. g of x must be x squared. And yeah, g prime of x is 2x, which is what you see right here. So this is, this is g prime. This is f circle g as functions of x. So it matches. A is the square root of pi over 6. B is the square root of pi over 3. G of A, remember G is x squared. G of x is x squared. G of A is A squared. Square root of pi over 6 squared is pi over 6. G of B is G of square root of pi over 3. Plug that in there. Pi over, square root of pi over 3 squared is pi over 3. What's a sketch of the proof? And I am calling this a sketch because I'm just going to focus on the equation. Technically speaking, maybe I can say this verbally, you should verify the function is Riemann integrable to begin with. Um, what do we assume again? We assume g, g was differentiable and g prime was Riemann integrable, and f was continuous. Certainly this composition is continuous. g prime is not necessarily continuous, but is Riemann integrable. The product of two Riemann integrable functions will be Riemann integrable. That would be how you can justify that this function is Riemann integrable. And in fact, you can also justify that it's Riemann integrable because you can write down an antiderivative. And that's the crux of the getting the equality right. Little f is continuous, so it's Riemann integrable. And by the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's got an antiderivative. Call it capital F. The derivative is always equal to little f. There exists a capital F such that this is true for all x in the interval, I guess, between g of a and g of b. And I okay, g of a is not necessarily less than g of b here. In the closed interval, g of a and g of b as endpoints. I'm not saying which one's less than the other. In 
fact, they could even be equal, which would mean your interval would be just a point, and x would have to be that point. By the way, the, uh, this was supposed to be there exists, by the way. I forgot my little thing there. Um, so by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral of little f is capital F of B minus uh, capital F of A. Excuse me, sorry. Integral of little f from G of A to G of B <coughs> is capital F of G of B minus capital F of G of A. I claim that that difference also equals this integral. What do you think the connection is? Any idea? Besides the fundamental theorem of calculus? How do you connect? How, how are you going to say this equals that as well? Does the notation F of G Chain rule. Chain rule, yeah. Exactly. The chain rule implies that the derivative, I'll go ahead and use DDX notation, of f of g of x, capital F of g of x, is capital F prime of g of x times g prime of x, but capital F prime is little f. So this function, capital F of g of x, this is for all x, this time in the interval from a to b. And I guess, again, I'm not even assuming a is less than b here. Right, because you can give meaning to the integral even if the lower limit is bigger than the upper limit of the integral. Interval containing A and B as endpoints. <coughs> In other words, that function capital F of G of X, capital F circle G, is an antiderivative of this function, this integrand here. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can plug the limits of integration A and B into this antiderivative, into this thing, and calculate the difference, and you're going to get the exact same thing. Definitely a sketch of the proof, OK? Right. Very much sketched it. Should I say it again? Should I go through it again? I think I have put this proof on test before as well. Um, technically speaking, if you're going to do a full proof, you would need to first verify that this is Riemann integrable. And actually just verifying that the derivative of that is this function is not quite enough because derivatives aren't necessarily continuous, they aren't necessarily Riemann integrable. Think of the one with infinitely many oscillations. F is assumed to be continuous, G is assumed to be differentiable, and its derivative is assumed to be Riemann integrable, left, though not necessarily continuous. Composition of two continuous functions is continuous, G is differentiable, therefore continuous. G prime is Riemann integrable. The product of two Riemann integrable functions is Riemann integrable. Continuous functions are Riemann integrable. You know. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, there exists an antiderivative of little f. Here's a different letter here. Let C be between G of A and G of B. That would be an antiderivative of little f. Fundamental theorem of calculus guarantees there's a capital F such that this is true. I'm assuming little f is continuous. And moreover, that when you do this integral, you get this difference. So what's left to do is to show this difference also equals this integral. By the chain rule, the derivative of this function is the integrand. 
In other words, for all x, in other words, this is an antiderivative of this. And so you can do the integral by doing the same difference, plugging a and b into this function. And that's the exact same expression. I guess we're about out of time. Um, so, no class until Friday, but there will be a lot of completion stuff to do from section 5.3. I think it's all kind of fun stuff, personally. It's, I think it's more fun than epsilons and deltas. Epsilons and deltas are necessary, of course, and they can be fun to a degree, but right, then trying to get past that to a degree maybe is, you know, it's more fun to use the fundamental theorem of calculus at the end of Even though it's kind of tricky. There's your favorite word, Travis. Tricky. I actually like trick. You like trick better? <laughs> All right, we'll see you Friday.